Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that nice introduction, Bruce. And uh, Hello everybody and um, welcome and thank you for joining this session. Um, I am so pleased, I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to talk about feline liver disease because it truly is one of my most favorite areas of internal medicine. Um, and um, I think one of the reasons is that um, you know, we talk about that expression, cats are not small dogs, and um, there is probably no system for which that is more true than for the liver. Um, I mean, just look at this uh, on this title slide here. Look at this crazy looking liver on the bottom here. This is an example of white bile syndrome that we see really, really rarely in cats. Uh, we don't see it in dogs. And then look at the whole rest of this liver. It's just really crazy looking. Um, and there's so many differences between uh, the dog and the cat that it's in terms of the types of liver disease that they get that I think it's really important to think about them as very different, um, you know, very different approaches, very different species. Um, so in fact, uh, for this first little section here, I wanted to just kind of do an overview comparing canine and feline liver disease to give you kind of the big picture. And then we'll dive right into the two most common types of liver disease in cats. And I'll spend about an hour or so on each of those. And then at the very end, what I'll do is um, talk a little bit about how to place feeding tubes in cats, the nasal feeding tubes that are so useful for treating many types of sick cats, but including uh, cats that aren't eating because of liver disease. Um, so with that, um, let's get started. Uh, I'll give you a small apology first that I may be just a tad slow this morning. My tongue might get a bit tangled up now and again. It's um, 8 o'clock in the morning here in Minnesota and it's exceptionally cold. Um, <laughs> we are experiencing um, a I'll have to say fairly typical January weather, but right now I just let my dog out about half an hour ago and it is minus 20 degrees Celsius outside. Um, I mean, I, uh, anyway, um, and this is what the, um, the hospital entrance looked like the other day, the veterinary medical center at the university covered in snow and ice. And uh, Minnesotans, however, are pretty hardy people. And uh, here you can see this fellow out with his bike, even though we've just had a snowstorm the other day. Um, and uh, notice he's not riding it. I think going uphill in the snowstorm was probably just about too much for him. But anyway, we, uh, we're a pretty hardy bunch here. Anyway, so if I, um, if I stumble on a word here or two uh, to get started with, uh, please, please forgive me. All right, so what I wanted to do here is just kind of lay out um, a bit of a framework for thinking about liver disease in the dog and liver disease in the cat. So on the left panel throughout the next set of slides will be what we see in the dog and then on the right the kind of comparative piece for the cat. So we all know in dogs that steroid hepatopathy is an extremely common type of liver problem to run into. Um, it is one that, of course, we see in dogs with Cushing's, like this little uh, Maltese here. And it also is something that we see whenever we give steroids, whether it is systemic steroids or even topical steroids, we can see this um, used for dermatologic purposes or uh, otic preparations, even ophthalmic preparations. If at high enough doses, it's possible to get the changes in the liver that are kind of characterized by the syndrome of steroid hepatopathy. Usually not a clinical uh, disease, um, but certainly one that causes um, mild to very marked increases in liver enzymes and liver size and can be confounding when trying to evaluate a dog where we really don't know the cause of the liver enzyme increases. In the cat, cats just do not develop steroid hepatopathy. It doesn't matter how much steroids you give cats, they do not develop the syndrome of big liver, glycogen deposition, increased liver size. It just does not happen. So uh, first thing there then is when we're looking at a serum chemistry panel and we're looking at liver enzymes in a cat, no matter whether they've had steroids or not, we cannot ascribe any changes in the liver enzymes to the administration of steroids. All right, now cats, of course, um, as we'll talk about in a little bit, have their very own peculiar kind of um, hepatopathy associated with uh, vacuoles in the liver, and that is the syndrome of hepatic lipidosis. 
Um, and as we'll get to, this is a syndrome associated with anorexia. So regardless of what has put that cat off food, it is the uh, consequences of that anorexia that result in the tremendous accumulation of fat within the liver and this isn't glycogen this is actually triglyceride so here's an example from postmortem of a fat very fatty liver you can see how pale it is and you can also see how friable it is look at all these micro fractures that have happened even before anything has been done in terms of handling this particular section of liver now, in the dog, we do see an equivalent accumulation of fat in the liver in a couple of circumstances. We can get it to some extent with obesity, as happens in people, by the way. Um, tremendous accumulation of triglyceride in the liver with obesity in people, and to some extent in dogs. We don't tend to see quite the extreme. But where we do see a fairly extreme accumulation of, of triglyceride is in uh, canine diabetes mellitus. So that makes sense. They're mobilizing peripheral fat stores. They're depositing um, some of that triglyceride in the liver, and that is uh, part of the syndrome of, of diabetes, which we also see in cats. Okay, we do see that in diabetic cats as well. Um, and of course, if the cat is diabetic and ketoacidotic, it may be anorectic, so we may actually get into what we call the hepatic lipidosis syndrome. So here I'd like to really distinguish between the dog developing asymptomatic fat accumulation with either obesity or diabetes. Okay, that is that does not make them sick. They are not anorectic. They're they're not. They're usually their liver enzymes are unchanged or very mildly increased. Um, they are not jaundiced. It is an asymptomatic fat accumulation in the liver. Contrast that with the cat when when they get. Uh, sick, stop eating, develop this um, accumulation of fat in the liver, they become much sicker. They develop a, an entire sort of spiraling syndrome of clinical signs around uh, related to that fat accumulation. So a very important difference here between the dog and the cat. All right. Um, I think um, Dr. Willard is, uh, my colleague Dr. Mike Willard is going to be talking uh, later on in this, um, in this virtual congress about uh, canine liver disease and I'm sure that one of the things that he will be touching on or spending some time with is chronic hepatitis in dogs. And it is in fact um, one of the most common liver diseases that we encounter in dogs in two forms, either the one associated with copper accumulation, shown here with the special stain, you can get some appreciation that this section of the liver has um, not just inflammation but and fibrosis, but a lot of copper. Um, and then the one uh, that's the majority of the cases, about two-thirds actually, um, that we are not entirely sure of the etiology. It may be immune-mediated, but it is steroid responsive, so that is the terminology that is usually applied to it. So this is an inflammatory disease of the liver parenchyma in dogs under the umbrella title of chronic hepatitis. Okay, In the cat, it is very rare to see inflammation of the parenchyma of the liver as the major finding. So hepatitis is extremely rare in cats. It can happen and it is even more rarely associated with copper, so, uh, copper storage, um, but that is uh, something that is so, un, so rare that you might go through your entire career as a practicing vet and never see a case, um, so it's that rare. Um, and so uh, it, I'll talk about cholangitis and cholangiohepatitis in the cat and that is the inflammatory condition that we see in feline liver whereas in dogs we see this uh, inflammation focused on the parenchyma of the liver and that falls under this umbrella of chronic hepatitis. All right, now chronic hepatitis in the dog um, can progress to hepatic fibrosis and that is usually characterized by pretty marked portal hypertension resulting in ascites. So here we have a kind of classic case of this where the dog's pretty bright and alert. He's not encephalopathic or otherwise necessarily all that ill, um, although they can be. But if this is a chronic condition and develops pretty slowly, then they may be fairly bright and alert and in, um, you know, good um, sort of good spirits, but at the same time have marked ascites and marked weight loss. So 